Uh, this GIP is uh, a lecture on Sakaki Hyaksen. On the 5th of this month, uh, in, the, in, in April 2013, that is, I gave a lecture on Sakaki Hyaksen at the Berkeley Art Museum to mark the acquisition of a pair of screens by him that I bought from a dealer in Japan and presented to the Berkeley Art Museum. Uh, uh, part of the purpose of the lecture was to ask the audience for, for donations toward a fund for restoring the screens. They're in pretty good condition, but they need restoration. I opened my lecture by thanking Julia White and Larry Rinder for arranging the lecture and remarking that I haven't lectured at the Berkeley Art Museum for a long time and that it brings back happy memories. My lecture was supposed to be recorded as I spoke, and I planned to use the recording as a soundtrack for a video uh, with the audience reaction and other ambient sounds. But long after the lecture was over, I learned that the recording device had somehow failed and that it hadn't been recorded. So here I am repeating it, somewhat expanded as I say, for this video. I've added more images, a few, and made it somewhat longer, but I'll be speaking as those of the Berkeley Art Museum audience, beginning now. Here we go. First, please. My title is Mr. Sokaki and Me, Two Frustrated Sinophiles, meaning, that is, two people who are standing in Japan, as you know, we were at different periods, and gazing across at China. I was in Japan, unable to go to China because of Americans couldn't at that time. Sakaki Hyaksen, back in the early 18th century, was uh, of a Chinese family and probably wished he could go back to China, but there was no chance for him to do so. Anyway, the person standing next to me in this photo will have to stand in for Mr. Sakaki, although it isn't he. Sakaki Hyaksen lived as from 1697 to 1752, so he can't be in a photo with me. This is Mr. Suhara whom we'll talk about later, but he can stand in for now. Sakaki Yuxin, as I say, was born into a family that was probably of Chinese origin and perhaps had moved to Japan during the turmoil at the end of the Ming in the mid-17th century. They had established a Chinese-style pharmacy, a uh, Japanese kampo or Han method, in Nagoya. Um, Yuxin didn't want to be a pharmacist. He wanted to be a Chinese scholar artist like the ones he could read about in Chinese books and see in Chinese paintings. But there was no way he could get there, and he had to make do with what he could search out of Chinese culture and Chinese paintings in Japan. His companion in this photo, James Cahill, had become a specialist in Chinese painting, but had to spend a lot of time in Japan instead, unable to go to China until later. In 1971 to 72, he had a sabbatical year and spent it in Japan with his family, whom we'll see later. And he spent this sabbatical doing research on Sakaki Hyaksen, writing a book-length study that was published and translated by Yoko Woodson in three issues of the art journal Bijutsushi in 1976 to 79. The original English text was later published in 1983 by our Institute of East Asian Studies. I'm sorry to say that they are out of print. No more copies available. Now on to my lecture. Next. Well, this photo is of the German art historian Ernst Gombrich. I put it on to cite his famous account in his book Art and Illusion of how a painting tradition develops with each artist inheriting schemata or patterns from his teachers and then correcting them by observation and so forth. The whole group of them working as if collectively over the centuries, toward greater visual truthfulness. His belief was that this happened only in Europe. I was able to convince him when we spent time together in England late in his life that there was one other tradition of which this was true, that is Chinese painting through the Song. In each case, artistic means are developed for creating illusions of mass and space in the paintings that enable uh, painting to reach heights of illusionism. Next. Here's a well-known Chinese painting of which this illusion is powerfully achieved. Other traditions of painting achieve greatness in different ways, but only China and Europe in that way. Next. 
anonymous work of the late Song, 12th, 13th century, preserved in Japan. The Japanese knew early Chinese painting from lots of great examples that were preserved there, but they were cut off from China in the later period. They couldn't see much of major Yuan Ming painting. The kind of illusionism, or naturalism, whatever we want to call it, that this painting represents with its space and mass and so on, was so scorned by the Chinese literati who dominated collecting and criticism in the later centuries that such painting mostly can be seen only in Japan. That's another big subject which I dealt with at length in another of my videos. Next. But there were still artists who were practicing it in different ways in the late Ming and early Qing periods in China, artists whose works could have been seen in Japan. This one by the late Ming master Zhang Hong. Next. Mountains built up with earth masses, volumetrically rendered with surface texturing and shading, areas of trees with rich foliage patterns, and so forth. Next. My own engagement with Japanese painting began when I was a fellowship student and later a curator at the Freer Gallery in Washington, and was able to spend time with such great works as these Waves at Matsushima Screens by So Tatsu. Works of this school, along with the great Yamato a tradition of narrative hand scrolls and so on, were the basis of the Japanese painting tradition as we studied it. Next. Another pair of screens by Sotatsu, representing the wind and thunder gods. This so-called decorative school it was a somewhat pejorative term, as in as one speaks of things as being merely decorative, and I tended to avoid the term in my teaching. The other great master of it was Ogata Korin. These are, of course, great paintings, transcending the usual idea of decorative by far. Tracing the development of these was central to my teaching of Japanese painting back in those days. It was a line and color tradition with no texturing, no real space. Everything is if pressed against the picture plane. Next. Here for contrast is a landscape, not a major one, but a good one. Uh, it's on view upstairs in our museum. That is, I'm still speaking of in the terms of my lecture. Uh, by the great later 18th century master Yosa Busan, who was in a sense a disciple of Hyaksen and a far greater painter than he. Even in a lesser work of Busan like this one, the earth forms are volumetric, areas of tree foliage and bamboo have real texture and depth. I want to emphasize here that I'm not talking about quality. Kodin's is a far greater painting. If I were given a choice, of course, I would grab the coat in and run, uh, with all respect to Busan. Next. A few words about how I came to be so enthusiastic about Japanese nanga painting. Back in 1953, when I was a fellowship student at the Met, a great exhibition of Japanese art came there with the delegation of Japanese curators led by Ishizawa Masao. Uh, he later, after returning to Japan, became director of the Yamato Bunkakan near Nara and he appears at the far left in this photo, along with some other rather scruffy-looking people whom I'll bring back later in another photo. They have stopped at the Yamato Bunkakan on their rambles, and they were somewhat embarrassingly photographed for publication in the museum journal in this picture. Next. Along with a lot of other wonderful paintings in that show was an album titled Album of Mists and Clouds by Uragami Gyokudo. This is one leaf of it. It was completely new to me. In fact, it was new to the world outside Japan, and a real revelation, quite different from any Japanese paintings that we were familiar with. Next. Here's another leaf from Gokodo's album with a mountain that pushes out the top of the picture space. Uh, this was at a time when I was still heavily affected by abstract expressionist movement in American painting and the theories associated with it. And I saw this, of course, as an amazing precursor of that, and it planted in my mind a determination to find out more about this unknown school of Japanese painting called Nanga and introduce it to American audiences, as, and I, as I did later, but that's another story for another uh, video. Next. Then during my Fulbright year in Japan, 1954 to 55, 
I was taken by se several people on trips to meet collectors and see the great paintings they owned. One who arranged such trips and accompanied me on them was the dealer Mayuyama Junkichi, whom I'd come to know during his visits to the U.S. We had met once by chance in New York City, and both strangers to the place had gone around together for a time. Next. Another who introduced me to major collectors and took me to visit them, the subject of lecture in itself, was my great teacher Shimada Shujiro. He and Mayoyama took me to, among others, next, the great novelist and Nobel Prize winner, uh, Kawabata Yasunari. How I came to know him well, stayed overnight at his house on one memorable occasion, later showed him paintings at the Freer, met him finally in Taiwan. This is another long story, which I did tell in another of my videos. Among uh, the treasures of Japanese art that he owned was next, the Winter Landscape by Gyokudo, titled Tōun Shisetsu, Eastern Cloud Scatters Snow, a National Treasure. I made some 15 details from it, and I'll devote the main section of one of my video lectures to showing them and talking about this amazing painting. Next. Kawabata also owned the National Treasure pair of albums titled Juben Jugi, meaning something like Ten Conveniences and Ten Pleasures, painted in 1771 by Ikeno Taiga and Yosa Busan, respectively. These are also the subjects of another of my forthcoming video lectures, based on the slides that I shot of them with details at Kawabata's house long ago, long ago. The next. I spent my sabbatical year 1972-3 to three in Japan with my family my then wife Dorothy, and our children Nicholas, now leading an archaeological excavation in Turkey, uh, and our daughter Sarah, whom I needn't introduce to Bay Area cultivated audiences. On the contrary, I am often identified to my great satisfaction uh, by my chief distinction of being Sarah Cahill's father. Well, we are seen here at the entrance to the Kyoshi Kojin Temple near Takarazuka, where we spent a lot of time. Please remember that this was the early 70s when long hair for boys and men was still okay. Next. I had set out to study, because of my special background, straddling the two traditions of painting, the early period of Japanese nanga painting and its Chinese sources, what the Japanese artists could have seen and how they adapted it into their paintings. The standard account was that they had no opportunity to see genuine Ming Qing paintings in any number and they had to look to learn from woodblock printed copies of them. Here at right is a leaf from a group of Ming printed picture albums titled Hashu Gafu, and on the left an early Nanga painting based on it. Next. And here's a painting by one of the first generation Nanga artists, Gion Nankai, representing a landscape with a natural bridge, and beside it the Chinese print from which the image was taken. Similarly, they did print paintings of famous places in China, such as the West Lake at Hangzhou, based on prints. Identifying these printed sources was a big part of early Nanga studies in Japan. I included this landscape by Nankai as the first item in my Nanga exhibition of 1972, commenting that it represented an extremely schematic use of the Chinese convention of dividing the scene into near, middle, and far. As a painting, it's dry and rather dull. Next. Paintings of bamboo and ink, seen here in examples by Nankai and Yanagisawa Kien, the other best-known early Nanga master, could easily be learned from woodblock printed sources. These are fairly dry and conventional. Next. A major source of landscape style were the landscape volumes of the Mustard Seed Garden Manual of Painting, printed in China in the early Qing period and reprinted in a Japanese edition, the so-called Kananbon, in Kyoto as early as 1748, the Bird and Flower Volumes, and 1753 for the Landscape Volumes, from which one double leaf is seen here. Ikino Taiga was one of the many Japanese artists who learned important features of his style from these printed sources. I once held a seminar about this back-and-forth movement between paintings and prints, 
and we planned an exhibition, but we never carried it through. Next. A work by Tygoth that used to be mine is on view upstairs, a painting done by him in 1749, in which he turns the forms of color woodblock printing to his purpose, combining them with some elements of Rimpa, the decorative school style of Japan, such as the flat treatment of the stream. A wonderful painting, which I'm very happy to see again. Next. So much for background. Now we come to our artist, Sakaki Hyuksen. Sometime around 1965, I saw exhibited at the Tokyo National Museum the pair of screens you see here by an artist unfamiliar to me named Sakaki Hyuksen. He painted them in 1747, and he inscribes them as being in the styles of two Chinese artists. For the left screen, it's the great Ming master Tang Yin, and for the right screen, it's the late Ming Suzhou schoolmaster Sheng Mao Ye. Next, the left screen, the one inscribed as being in the style of Tang Yin, doesn't show much sign of acquaintance with real Tang Yin paintings. It's unlikely that there were any to be seen in Japan, except perhaps minor figure paintings. But it's a convincing evocation of Ming painting style. Uh, applied to a large Japanese format of the screen. I was impressed. Next. The active masses that make up the riverbank are dynamic and the details entertaining. Distant buildings rising above fog, figures here and there, boats on the water. Next. A traveler with a staff crossing a bridge pauses to look down into the water. His servant follows carrying a heavy load. These are seen beyond a diagonal bank shaded for volume and leafy trees with dotted foliage around the exposed trunks and branches. The curling cloud refers back to old Chinese conventions, as does the river flowing over rocks. Next. And there is believable space achieved through skillful handling of ink values to make the distant forms paler the old device of atmospheric perspective. All these and other features of Chinese style seen in the screens aroused my interest, along with a limited admiration. This is clearly not the work of a great master in full control of his means and forms, but it exhibited kinds of mastery that I didn't expect to see in the work of an early Nanga master. This wasn't the work of a scholar amateur or literary man playing with a brush and ink, but the work of a serious painter. Next. The other screen, done in the manner of Sheng Mao Ye, a lesser master of the late Ming, although a very interesting one, who had played a strong role in our studies of late Ming painting, uh, it's another broad river view with lots of detail on the nearer bank. Next. A large pine and smaller deciduous trees are firmly rooted in the bulging masses of earth. A flat plateau atop one of them overlooks the river, and figures are seen crossing the bridge in lower right. Next. All this seems to reveal unmistakably a real visual acquaintance with paintings by Sheng Mao Ye. Here, unfortunately, in a black and white image, is one that I've used for comparison. I think it's in the Cleveland Art Museum depicting scholars and servants pausing on one of, their, on one of these flat river banks to gaze into the water and uh, into the tall trees. I won't take the time to point out the similarities. They are obvious. This, I immediately realized, went well beyond what other early Nanga masters were capable of. Who was the Sakaki Hyaksen, and where could I see more of his paintings? Next. A detail of the figures good evocations of the familiar scholar gentleman of Ming painting out to enjoy the scenery, accompanied by their boy's servant, one of those flat-topped little boys seen in the works of late Ming Suzhou masters. Inquiring among Japanese colleagues, I soon learned that seeing more of Hyaksen's work would not be easy. Uh, no exhibition of his paintings had been held for decades and the single small one from the 1930s, all drawn from a single private collection, could be seen only in old photographs at the Bunkazai Kankyujo. The collection itself had reportedly been burned. No reproduction book devoted to Hyaksen's work had been published, and no full-scale study of him had been attempted. 
So I began by working from these photographs of lost works, meanwhile making inquiries about where paintings by him still extant could be seen. Next. Back to the left screen of the Tokyo National Museum pair. Familiar images from traditional Chinese paintings are the occupied houses on the shore and the tingza, or viewing shelter, on a plateau above. Next. But I want to call attention especially to the trees, some of them red-leafed and indicating the season, all done with varied leafage patterns around exposed trunks and branches. For the largest tree, foliage is rendered with a piling up of small strokes and dotting, varied in tone. Next. This was a technique developed in ink monochrome painting of the Sung period, for instance, in this early 12th century painting. It had become a basic resource for Chinese landscape, but was virtually unknown in Japan until this time. And now here it was being used with some skill by Hyaksen. Next. Another Sung painting, again a section of a hand scroll, to represent the type. The trunk and branches of the tree are shaded for cylindricality. The foliage is rendered in varying ink tonality to give it depth, paler strokes receding, darker ones coming forward. But back to Yuxen and my engagement with him during my sabbatical year in Japan. Next. Here I am seen with my old and good friend Suji Nobuo, who helped me during the year I spent working on Hyaksen. We made trips together to see collections, and he organized meetings of the Nihon Bijushushi Gokkai, or Japan Art History Association, for me to present my findings and elicit help from Japanese specialists. I was in a special position to undertake this study because of my knowledge of Ming Ching painting, so that I could recognize what Hyaksen was learning from and how closely he learned it and because I was comfortable within the Japanese art world by language training and otherwise. Tsuji Sensei is still very much with us. He's now the director of the rich Miho Museum. At right is the English publication of my study, which was, as I said, published first in Japanese in Biju Sushi in a translation done by Yoko Woodson. It was very well received by Japanese art historians, one of whom hailed it as a rare case in which a foreign scholar had made a significant contribution to Japanese art studies. That, of course, has changed a lot since then, but it had some truth at the time. Next. At the first of these presentations, I showed a slide made from a photo. The original painting was among those that were burned, of the Hyaksen painting of scholars having a party in a garden. It contains so many elements foreign to Japanese painting that it raised the question of how Hyaksen could have learned about these. The answer, it turned out, was simple. Next. He had copied a Ming painting that was in Japan, an anonymous work. I came to know it through Larry Sickman, who bought it at a small price from a minor dealer in Kyoto to hang in the Nelson Gallery, not for its excellence as a painting, for real collection pieces he aimed much higher than this, but to hang it in his Chinese furniture room because the furniture depicted in it could be interestingly compared with real pieces. My audience of Japanese scholars was struck by this discovery, especially when I added that they had been looking in the wrong places for the Chinese sources for Nanga pictures. They looked at the major works in their museums and books, while the real sources were more likely to be minor and neglected works in the storage room drawers and cabinets of museums and dealers. Next. I should add immediately that it was unusual for Hyaksen to copy a whole painting this way. Usually he adapted motifs and elements of style and used them for his own purposes. Another Hyaksen painting preserved only in a photo is this one of a seated scholar and his servant. And again, my familiarity with late Ming painting of the Suzhou school allowed me to find a close parallel in, next, the painting of Li Shi Da, late Ming artist, such as this one representing a scholar and his two boy servants preparing tea outdoors, the hunched over figures, the flat top boys, the linear manner all correspond closely. Next. A detail from a fan painting by Li Shi Da. 
Once pointed in this direction, I quickly established the close links between Yuxin's figure style and painting of late Ming Suzhou. Later, I was to learn from a symposium paper by a scholar named Oba Osamu, and from talks with him, about how and why certain kinds of Ming painting came to Japan during the Edo period. Next. Another example, a section of a hand scroll with a fake signature of Wenzheng Ming, which I once owned myself. Continuing with Oba Osamu's account, Chinese dealers would buy up paintings that were inexpensive and plentiful in the Jiangnan or Yangtze Delta region of China, among which the Suzhou professionals works were prominent, and they would bring them to Nagasaki for sale to Japanese dealers, who then would take them to the major centers where collectors could acquire them. This is all recounted in detail in a long paper that I wrote and published with his help and with that of Yoko Woodson. I can give a proper reference to anyone who wants to explore the matter. Uh, this is actually one of the CLPs, Cahill Lectures and Papers, on my website, titled Phases and Modes in the Transmission of uh, Ming Qing Painting Styles to Edo Period Japan. Next. I drew and wrote out this diagram to use in lectures, showing how old traditions of painting divided and flourished or ended during the Ming. This is too complex a matter to go into here, and this is all stuff that has to do with the so-called northern and southern schools. There are nobody's, nobody's much interested in them anymore. Next. Ha <laughs> ha. Here's another painting by Hyaksen depicting Chinese scholars getting drunk in a garden with the same servants done in pretty much the same style. And here is one by Yosa Buson, who in his early period learned an adept adopted a lot from Hyaksen, being virtually his disciple. They must have known each other in Kyoto during Hyaksen's late year there. Busan would, of course, go on to become a much greater painter. His strong mastery of composition, along with the clear derivation, can be seen clearly even in this comparison. Next. The first part of my study dealt with Hyaksen figure paintings, and I'll show a few of them quickly. Here is one of the Taoist philosopher Zhuangzi having his famous dream that he is a butterfly. You know the dream. He wakes up and, and he can't decide whether he's Zhuangzi having dreamed about being a butterfly or a butterfly who is now dreaming that he is Zhuangzi. Ha <laughs> ha. Next. A man on a donkey by another artist and a drunken Li Bo, the great Tang poet Li Bo, Li Bai, by Hyaksen. What these artists were doing was supplying images of Chinese sages and noble scholars to the large population of Japanese Sinophiles or China enthusiasts, many of them members of the merchant class, not the samurai, uh, who wrote Chinese-style poetry, looked at what Chinese paintings they could find, and so on. The paintings could hang in the person's study or in communal rooms where they met with friends to discuss the poems they, they loved, along with others of China's cultural products that were accessible to them. Next. Another Hyaksen figure painting from which I have only these two images of the upper and lower parts. It represents a wood gatherer, an ideal figure in the Chinese cultural myth, who is much given to reading the classics and philosophizing. Next. A rather mysterious and fine work by Hyaksen, identifiable as his by his seals on it, is this one, now in our exhibition upstairs. I myself found it at a minor dealer's shop, hanging among rows of junky paintings, and bought it cheap. I speculated in my study about why, about or what rather, Hyaksen might have seen some late Ming figure painter, such as Choi Tzu Jung, perhaps. Anyway, it's a work of more than unusually high finish, displaying his technical mastery as a professional painter, which, of course, is what he was. Next. Hyaksen compiled and published a collection of brief notes on Chinese artists of the Yuan and Ming titled Genmin Gajin Ko, or Researches on Painters of the Yuan and Ming, which has been traditionally hailed in Japan as a major early contribution to the study of Chinese artists there. I spent some time uncovering the truth about it. 
Hyaksen had simply used a copy of the Qing court compilation Pei Wen Chai Shu Hua Pu, which must still have been a rare item in Japan, and copied out the entries from that, skipping arbitrarily and choosing every fourth or fifth one. This I presented in a section of my study titled The Genmin Gaojin Ko Exposed. I love to expose scholarly tricksters. I've done the same with the famous Dutch scholar Robert Van Hulik. It doesn't lessen in the least my admiration for them. I hope I'll be remembered as something of a trickster myself, although I can't remember being guilty of plagiarism or misrepresentation of this kind. Next. Besides pursuing Chinese styles in his landscape paintings, Hyakushin was also a pioneer, virtually the originator, of the completely Japanese style of poetry painting called haiga, simple sketchy paintings done to accompany haiku poems written in free, elegant calligraphy. Busan was, of course, a great master of this, but he was preceded in it by Hyakusen. Here is a tall, narrow uh, haiga. Uh, they typically were done in unusual formats, representing a deer, its head and horns, and its body rendered simply but volumetrically in broad strokes of ink of varying tonality. Next. Two more haiga by him, one of flowers and grasses growing on an earth bank, with a haiku poem written by him, and another of which I have only a detail, representing a performing monkey on a rope. Next. A narrow horizontal painting of a fox and lotus root, which he painted in 1747, and signs with the name Hassen, Eight Immortals. He used different names for his Japanese style and his Chinese style paintings. Another matter that I'll discuss in my study, but won't elaborate on here. He adds to his signature that he painted this while drunk, and that may well have been true. Japanese Nanga artists often worked while they were tipsy. Next. His dedication to the Japanese tradition of haiku is expressed in this imaginary portrait of the great haiku master Basho, whether the haiku poem written in the upper right, presumably one of Basho's, was written by him or by someone else, I'm not sure. It could be by him. Next. And here is another portrait of Basho, which he painted in 1747. While staying, his inscription says, at a temple in Kyoto. Next. As a haiga painter and haiku poet, as well as an admirer and portrayer of Basho, Hyakusen has succeeded and once again surpassed by Yosa Busan, who, who surely knew Hyakusen's work. Here is a strange kind of collaboration. Busan must have found a painting of Shoki, or Junkwe the Demon Queller, that Hyakusen had sketched quickly and inscribed in 1749, and he added playfully the demon that Shoki is pursuing, dating his part to 1777. Such a collaboration across the decades adds to all the ev evidence we have about how devoted and how indebted Busan was to Hyakusen. Next. Also hanging upstairs in our gallery and also testifying to Hyakusen's devotion to haiku and its practitioners is this imaginary portrait of the Kyoto legendary figure known as Bai Cha O, the old tea seller, who roamed the street selling tea and reciting verses. This one was left to the Berkeley Art Museum along with the rest of his painting collection by my close friend and longtime companion, Hugh Wass. I can't expand on that identification without slipping into an unsuitable degree of emotionalism. I'll have to let it stand. Next. One of the very few paintings that I still own myself after conveying most of my collection to the Art Museum and to my children is this horizontal painting by Hyakusen of two workers perhaps woodcutters, relaxing on a bamboo raft floating on the river. In simple images and sketchy drawing, Hyakusen has conveyed with deep perception the appearances and the moods of the two men, or so the painting would persuade us, at least me. Again, an emotional attachment beyond scholarship. Next. A Hyakusen painting of windblown bamboo at right, which I contrast with the static and conventional one by Gion Nankai, brought back at left, I showed it earlier. Hyakusen should be in our museum, 
but instead it's owned by a Seattle collector, Dan Henderson, whom I was showing around the Kyoto shops on his visit many years ago, and we were shown this, and I allowed him to buy it, and have cursed myself ever since. Hyakusen signs it with his Haiga name, emphasizing his departure from, from traditional Chinese practice. Next. Now quickly a few of Hyakusen's landscapes of the figures, beginning with this one owned by a dealer. Hyakusen's works are still on the market in Japan, and I'd be glad to advise anyone interested in acquiring them, especially if it's for a eventual gift to our Berkeley Art Museum. A man hurries along the river shore under an umbrella, past a tingsa, or rest shelter, of the kind that are seen so regularly in traditional Chinese landscapes. The insistent dotting all over the surface, with the dots detached from solid form and conveying the effect of the rainstorm, creates a suitably agitated surface effect. By the time he did these paintings, Hyakusen had mastered such techniques in a way completely unprecedented in Japan. Here Hyakusen uses his mastery of Chinese-style brushwork to convey the feeling of the rainstorm, the force of the wind, the darkened sky. I could show a great Chinese landscape with rainstorm from the Southern Song period if there were time. No Western artist, I think, has conveyed the force and feeling as well. And then I inserted uh, the great painting in the Kuonji in Japan, which I didn't have time to show in, uh, at my Berkeley Art Museum lecture, but which I put in now. I think it's known to many of you. It was shown in one of my lectures on Southern Song painting, the one that also included up on Ma Lin. Anyway, this is great landscape, which for me is the best rainy landscape in world art. Next. This one by Hyuk Sen, representing the poet Li Bo, or Li Bai, and a friend gazing at a waterfall, was the Hyuk Sen work that I chose for my Nanga exhibition. The top of the waterfall pouring over the edge of the cliff is powerfully depicted, as is the base with the splashing of the water dynamically conveyed. The figures. One of the servant boys brings a load of things to eat and drink. The other holds a bundle of scrolls, which they will admire or write on. Closer in. Hyakusen is by now thoroughly adept at portraying and characterizing the gaucher or lofty scholar image that peoples the ideal landscapes of China. And we can imagine him, as I do in my study, dreaming of being one himself, instead of being a professional painter of low status working in Japan. Next. Another painted in 1745 of another scene familiar from Chinese examples. A scholar leans over the veranda of his riverside house to buy a fish from a fisherman. The landscape screen behind him is a lake scene with sailing boats. Next. Another with a group of scholars pausing on a natural bridge to admire the waterfall. One of them writes a poem on a piece of paper while the boy's servant holds his inkstone. Once more, his model can be seen in Ming paintings, such as this one by Shang Mao Ye, which we saw before. Hyuk Sen still cannot integrate the elements of his picture spatially and a surface pattern in the way that a Chinese artist does, but he has mastered such techniques far beyond the grasp of any other artist in Japan. Next. Um, this is a night scene by Hyuk Sen, quite remarkable. It isn't easy even to find anything like it in Chinese painting. Thick fog winds through the valleys. Fishermen are at work with nets, and a man returns late from a trip or an outing, followed by a servant, to his house where someone, perhaps his wife, awaits his coming at the window. Once more, we can see this as inspiring an even more mysterious and haunting work by Busan, that is, this well-known one, a night scene with light coming from the windows of thatched houses in the upper part and from the fire and smoke of the cormorant fisherman's boat in the lower part. Mary Beth Graybill and I planned a great Busan exhibition for this museum that would have revealed the true stature of this great poet-painter. It was brutally shot down by Japanese authorities, probably in retaliation for something I had done, a bitter story that's told on my website. 
I weep inside when I think about what was lost. The last chapter of three in my book on poetic painting in China, the lyric journey that is, uh, China and Japan, is about Busan. And I remark in the preface that for the late period, the 18th and 19th centuries, Japanese painting seems to me even more attractive and interesting than the Chinese. Busan is a big reason for that. I approach the end of my lecture. Please be patient. Here we go. At last we return to the photo with which we began, and I will tell uh, why the person seen with me here, Mr. Suhara, no, it isn't Mr. Sakaki, why he was important to my Hyaksan project. He was the owner and the sole inhabitant, I think, of the Suhara House, where in 1751, late in his life, Hyaksan painted the first set of fusuma, or sliding door room dividers, done by a Nanga artist. The house is in Tonomine, a small town high up in the mountains southeast of Kyoto. He welcomed me, uh, talked of his trip to the U.S. with a forestry group that he belonged to, and showed me around the house. I asked him what it had been like growing up with these shakusen paintings. He said he hadn't liked them at all. Other people had pusuma with bright colored birds and flowers and people. Why couldn't they? And the paintings do indeed look rather austere and must have from the beginning. Next. The paintings that greet you as you enter the Genkan, the entryway of a Japanese house, represents a natural bridge over a waterfall and on it a lion done in bright colors glaring out at the new arrival as if menacingly. This was Shokusen's single little joke in the whole complex, the rest are dead serious. The image probably represents an old Buddha story about the mother lion who throws her cubs off the cliff into the water to test their survival skills, wanting to keep only those that manage somehow to climb her back. Chinese lions were not, of course, new to Japanese painting. Everybody who has studied it is familiar, for instance, with this famous painting of two of them by Kano Eitoku, done in the late 16th century. But Hyaksin's lion is looking right out at us, seeming to smile. And even and as we come closer, as we enter the house, it becomes a menacing image, uh, comically menacing to us, but maybe not to a child. Next. The rooms of the house are decorated, although that may not be the appropriate word, with paintings mostly in ink monochrome, a few touches of color that can be admired as new applications of the traditional Chinese plant subjects, blossoming plum, banana palm, orchids and rocks, uh, the ad adaptation of these to a new purpose, that is Japanese room dividers. How suited they are to that purpose remains a question. It may be that the original inhabitant of the house was a Sinophile who loved these subjects. There are a few smaller paintings of plant subjects in which Shakshen uses color and seems to be trying for a more decorative, visually attractive style, but they are tucked away, not prominent. I was familiar with the Suhara house paintings already from the publication of them in Kokka magazine by the leading Japanese specialist in Nanga painting, Yoshizawa Chu. So I was surprised when Mr. Suhara showed me into a small room near the Genkan, probably originally a storage room of some kind, with Fusuma paintings of bamboo and snow. These were not included in Yoshizawa's long article. Suhara told me that Yoshizawa had seen them, but decided they were not by Hyaksen. Yoshizawa later claimed that he hadn't been shown them. In, I, in any case, publishing these created a stir and embarrassed him more than I meant to do. But it would have been strange if bamboo had been left out of this program. And here it was in fine original paintings, giving the bamboo more spatial and seasonal setting than it usually receives. In the inner room, presumably the one occupied mostly by the master and mistress of the house, we come at last to landscape. With distant hills, a misty river shore, a nearer shore for easy entrance into the scene at the bottom. This must have been had the effect of seeming to open space beyond the painting surface, an effect common in Chinese painting, far less so in Japanese, but seldom used before in wall paintings.
Next. One broad panel in the tokonoma, or main display alcove of this room, uh, the last painting I'll show from this house, brings the scene closer. Rocky banks of a stream, pines and other trees growing from them, a bridge over the stream with people on it, and in the upper left, their destination, a storied pavilion with tile roofs and people inside. Here's the covered bridge with two scholars crossing it, followed by their boy servant, carrying what appears to be a scroll. The left side of the pavilion and figures. These paintings seem to have suffered more damage from wear and tear than the others, as is natural in a room where people moved around more. Next. The pavilion with people in it. One can see the damage especially here. This scene seems like a kind of final destination or climax uh, to the whole series, portraying Hoxton's ideal subject, the noble scholars of China, engaged in one of their elegant literary gatherings. I'll show a slide of the figures at the end of this lecture. We're nearing the end of it. There's only a few more to go. I don't know of any other Fusuma paintings by Hyuk Sen, although he may have done more, but a number of pairs of screens came to light while I was working on him. Notably, the pair from which this is taken, a private collection in Kyoto, representing another well-known scene from the iconography of the ideal Chinese scholar that is the Red Cliff scene, in which Su Dong Po and two of his friends are seen uh, uh, floating down in a in a boat past the cliff at night, and he recalls the famous battle that was fought there. Again, Hyaksen is demonstrating his ability to depict massive volumetric forms and use them to set off fine detail. A late and fine landscape painting by Hyaksen is this one, painted on satin, as I recall, and now in the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. I found it in Japan and introduced it to one of my docents who had been on my course at the Asian Art Museum. That was Gloria Hahn, who lived with her husband in Marin County and was an enthusiastic admirer of Chinese and Japanese landscape paintings. Her enthusiastic notes to me sent after my lectures on them, I still remember. Next. She loved this one, a late work that shows Hyaksen coming closer to total mastery of his beings and she had it hanging in their stairwell, as I recall. It represents, I think, a final move for Hyuk Sen into a style beyond realism and imitations of Chinese painting, into a poetic landscape style that is particularly Japanese and his own. But I'm not claiming that it's completely successful painting once more. I can only say that where Hyuk Sen stops short of greatness, Busan takes it up and moves into greatness. As I was moving back here from Vancouver, I learned that someone at the Asian Art Museum, not Yoko Woodson, who was retired from there, someone was objecting to the hanging of this painting and wondering whether they should keep it, since it didn't, they felt, come up to their best standards. We've borrowed the painting from the museum, and you can see it upstairs, the Berkeley Art Museum. I would be happy to buy it if they really don't want it and give it to the museum. It bears only Hyaksen seals, these two, the top one reading Shinen, the lower one reading Maitsu, or style name is Hyaksen. We'll see these again in a moment. Also late in his life, Hyaksen did a series of ink sketches that I know only from photos. These are among the paintings destroyed. Here he is moving into still another mode, Simple, sketchy, quickly drawn ink drawings. I wish very much that I could have seen these in the originals and that they had survived. Another one with thatched houses beneath trees. He signs these with the names he used for his haiga, recognizing that they belong within that Japanese type. But again, they are expanding the capacity of haiga, a form that Hyaksen virtually originated and develop beyond anything seen before. If some of you are again thinking proto busan you are absolutely right. Here is the leaf representing wind from Busan's great Jugi album, shown again in one of my earlier GIPs. The album done in 1771, 
about 20 years after Hyakusen's death. The similarities are obvious. I could give an hour-long lecture on how Busson's is the stronger composition and his ultimately the finer painting, but I'll show one more work by Hyakusen and then end my lecture. A year and a half ago, a Mr. Arai Yuzo, a person unknown to me, emailed me from Kawagoe, north of Tokyo, saying he knew of me as a Hyakusen scholar and enthusiast, and was writing to call my attention to a pair of Hyakusen screens owned by a local dealer. He, he attached a file of images, the ones I'll be showing, and he put me in touch with the owner. To make a long story short, the images persuaded me that this was a Hyakusen work very much worth having, and I paid to have the screen shipped to the Berkeley Art Museum, and after seeing them, purchased them from the dealer and gave them to the museum. And the acquisition of these screens, the ones on view upstairs, is the occasion for this, this lecture. This is the left screen. Next. Hyakusen writes no inscription or even signature on the screens, but only imprints his seals. These are the same two that I showed on the Asian Art Museum painting. This is his common practice in his late period to uh, impress only seals on his paintings, no writing. Next. Here is the right screen. The medium is one that was highly unusual, if not unprecedented, when they were painted. Ink monochrome painting done on a surface covered with gold and silver foil. Ink on paper was common. Ink and colors on gold foil was common, but not this. The effect is unusual. One can say negatively that it makes the imagery of the painting hard to see, or positively that it gives a strange depth to the imagery of the screens. Busson was to follow this practice in a pair of screens in the Kyoto National Museum painted in ink only on a silver ground. These have been pronounced a bad choice of medium by some and as a new subtle creation by others. The same can be said of these Shakshin screens. Next, a closer in detail. The two-storied pavilion with scholars gazing out are set among the trees. We are given masses of dense, varied foliage done in the kind of piled up brushwork in small strokes of varying shapes and tonality to build up an area that draws our vision into it in the way I showed before with examples from Sung painting. It's a radical departure from all linear or line and wash styles. If you want to think of an anticipations of pointillism or impressionism, it's justified, I think. Next. Another close in detail of a dense area of tree foliage. If the Western art term painterly comes into your mind, it also comes into mine. And again, it seems justified. But what is there comparable, really, at that period in Western painting? Here is a new and achieved style, which will be developed by Japanese artists who follow, but which already shows a remarkable mastery of pictorial means wholly new to Japan. Next. The right end of the right screen, with a detail from it, with the familiar image beneath bare trees situated at the end of a flat bank extending out into the water. But I needn't go on showing images of the screens, which you can see when you can see them in the originals on view in Gallery C upstairs. I was talking, remember, in the art museum. Next. My Hyaksen study in the original English version ended with a conclusion of nearly six pages of fine print, in which I imagined a return to the Suhara house, and specifically to that big painting in the Tokonoma representing Chinese scholars congregating for a poetic gathering. It provides an emotional ending, and I remember Yoko Woodson telling me that it made her weep when she read it. I'm certainly not going to read it now, but I'll summarize it briefly to conclude this lecture, and also tell anyone seriously interested that it will be printed with illustrations on my website, jamescahill.info, under Illustrated Writings. I should say later that it has been printed there on my website under illustrated writings, and you can read it there if you want to. All right, that ends this, uh, this video lecture. I went on in the uh, Berkeley Art Museum lecture to tell the audience they could go upstairs and look at the screens now. 
and to ask them if they wanted to contribute to a fund to, for the restoration of the screens. But for our purpose, this is the end.